Hello, everyone. Um, this is this is quite strange. I, I've done a few lectures on Zoom and I've had more Zoom meetings than are comfortable. But in myself, I rely so much on eye contact and what people look like. So it's been great to see where you come from and it's really nice to feel as if we're in touch. And this seminar is about you. It's actually much less about me sharing ideas than you exploring what complexity means to you right now. Along the way, I will talk a little bit about how, what complexity means to me and how I discovered it. So let's have a look at what I titled the work in the beginning, and I now have to do a screen share. Uh, slide, hang on. From the beginning, you are screen sharing. Um, so can I just ask you if it's if it's the whole slide? Not yet. I can see the slide, but it's not on full screen yet. Uh, okay, it doesn't seem to be quite doing that. Um, it doesn't want to take that. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we there go. We go. Excellent. There we go. Okay. Hi there. So what I'm asking you this afternoon, and I'm asking this to you individually, and I, and I would encourage you, if you can, to have a pencil and a piece of paper with you, just to jot down some ideas as I ask you some questions. So what I'm going to ask you is, how does an understanding of complexity and complex systems help you individually to thrive in these particularly uncertain times? Now, you'll see um, Sue introduced me as coming from the Institute for Water Research, and I also look after the Arua Water Center of Excellence. But if you have a look at the diagram in the middle, what I'm happiest doing is sitting in a river on a stone, picking up bits and looking for bugs under stones. Actually, we call them macroinvertebrates, but little wrigglies and looking at what they tell us and just really enjoying being out there. So the first thing I want us to consider is that one of the things that links you and me and every other single human being on the planet is that we all live on this particular planet in a catchment. If you didn't live in a catchment, you wouldn't be alive because a catchment is the piece of land that literally catches the water, catches rainfall. So the rain falls, it trickles down through the sand and the stones and falls over, um, flows over rocks, ends up in groundwater and rivers. We catch it in dams, we pump it to people. But the landscape, the land on which the rain falls, the land that supports all of our activities and the water that it catches is called a catchment. And we've come to call a catchment a social ecological system, a complex social, because there are people there, ecological, because everything happens on this planet, on the land, on the earth that we live on, and with all of the living things that we share it with. So if we have a look at the diagram on the left, and these are illustrations that from um, a little booklet that we wrote about helping people understand the water law in South Africa. And um, the artist has helped me with a number of publications where we try and take ideas to people in an understandable way. But there you see um, the picture, the stylized picture of clouds and rainfall up in the mountains. You see this great sweeping river down the, down the middle going down to the ocean. And you see heaps of activities that you all recognize. People carrying water, people living in villages, cities with smokestacks, agriculture with irrigation, heaps and heaps of taps and toilets. In the river, some animals, little bugs that live under the, under the stones that I love and work on, mayflies happen to be my favorites. Um, cows and trees, people swimming, wetlands, People 
treating that natural space as a spiritual space. And so the landscape and the water offer us heaps of services, things that we value and want to have. So let's look at what it means to think of this planet on which we live in this landscape, whether it's a city or a village or a small town. I live here in Makanda um, with all of its history as Grahamstown, with all of that mixed history from local people way back. We have wonderful sand spaces and koi um, people who've had stone, um, shell remains on our coasts right through to people who were cattle herders and then the great colonial space and the great movement out of that. So let's have a look at what it means to be here. Now, if we want to think about complex systems, and I want here to stop for a minute and clarify the difference between complex and complicated. Your computer, your laptop, or your telephone, or any of the mechanical things that we depend on are all immensely complicated. They have got bits and pieces in them I have no idea about and many ways of making them work. But they are characterized by being fairly predictable. And if they do something that you don't understand, somebody who knows them better can usually trace back and find out why that's happening. Complicated is designed and put together in ways that follow physical rules that are more or less predictable, that you can understand and you have less uncertainty about. Complex systems are fundamentally uncertain. They are fundamentally the places where you're not exactly sure what will happen next. And it's the characteristics of those complex complex systems that make them complex and does and create that uncertainty. So on this list, and um, we'll get to to the um, to the A to B wiggly line in a minute. But um, this happens to be a slide that came from a while ago. So it's missing the first and very most important characteristic, which is that complex systems are made of many, many elements. Um, we looked at all of the elements that went or some of the elements that went to make up a catchment. Think of your body and think of the way in which you're made up of organs and cells. Think of your families and the numbers of people in them. Think of your wider society living in a small town or a city. We all live in, the. I think most of us here live on the continent of Africa. Many, many parts linked together. Now, the processes that link us are very seldom linear. Now, linear is where one particular aspect will determine the rate or the outcome of another. Now, you can't see the whole screen, but if I take this little pen top and drop it, you couldn't see the drop, but you could hear it fall. Given gravity and the weight or mass of this particular little pen top, the rate at which it falls is entirely predictable and linear. If you were to graph it in terms of the rate of fall and the mass of it or gravity, you would get a straight line. Now, if you want to imagine the relationships among your family members, you would be hard pressed to say they were linear because people and themselves are inherently unpredictable and their personalities and the context they're living in will mean that those relationships are unexpected. There are some things that will be predictable. If I were to punch somebody, there would be a fairly predictable response of either upset or anger. There'd be a range of possibilities but it would be more predictable than perhaps other things. Then complex systems and all of these elements in complex systems also feed back. They tell other bits of the system what is going on. Now, one of the simplest examples of feedback is in your body in temperature control. Now, if the temperature drops, you've got a little sensor in the back of your brain that the blood goes past. And the temperature of that sensor 
tells your body whether things are getting hot or cold. When things get cold, there's another nervous system that feeds back and tells your muscles to shiver. And shivering activates movement in your muscles and warms you up. If it gets very hot, then the temperature of your blood says to the little sensor in the back of your neck, open up the sweat glands and you get quite glowy and hot and you might want to go and change your shirt or have a swim. And so our own bodies have these feedback mechanisms that tell us what's going on. And it's exactly that lack of feedback in this virtual room that makes it more difficult for me to understand or to get a feel for whether you're with me. But I hope you are. Then there's a question of scale. The elements in a complex system are very much influenced by their scale and by the scale of the different processes. You know that relationship scales are different one-on-one -on -one in a small group, in a very large auditorium, perhaps if you go to a concert or even if you go to the movies, in a city bigger than a village, and our global community, scale matters. It matters in all sorts of ways. It matters geographically. It matters in terms of relationships. There are all sorts of, it matters biophysically. So whether you're talking about a continent or a patch of grass in your garden, the processes will be different. Now, because of the many parts, because the many parts interacting with each other have processes that are not linear when you do something it is it has an unexpected con um, result and because of this you might make a small change you might have a very tiny virus affecting one person in a chinese city that has led to global catac cataclysm. More than another small virus that has drives a common cold that we've all made peace with. On the other hand, you might put a huge amount of effort and energy into a system you're trying to change and nothing happens at all. And this nothing happening at all can be because the existing elements and their feedbacks tighten the system up so that it's very difficult to shift it and allow it to, if you like, escape. Because of all these things, context is critical. Where things happen matters. And if context is critical, then the history of that context is critical because history shapes us. Each one of you will be able to think of your history and you'll be able to think about how it shapes you. So, I don't know how many of you are researchers, but if you seek research funding, you have to fill in something called a log frame. You have to say, these are my objectives related to a research question. And these are my activities, one, two, three, four, by which I will reach those goals. And this is the time frame in which I will do that. And I will deliver, deliver my project or my thesis on a particular date. And if you look at the line underneath the, um, the bullets on this, on this um, slide, you will see that there are characteristic pathways. And that kind of log frame planning assumes a linear pathway. I can get from A to B absolutely efficiently in a direct line. Now, the thing is, it's just not true. It's not true in your life, and it's certainly not true in my life. Think of waking up this morning. Now, think about one unexpected thing that happened to you this morning. My unexpected thing was discovering that I had a problem in the hardware or the functioning of my laptop, and the Rhodes IT system would only allow me to bring it in today so that they can look at it tomorrow. And that meant I didn't have my system functioning to prepare and get ready for today, and that has 
profoundly complicated and upset the process of my day. In fact, um, if you look at the line from A um, to B in the other little diagram, you'll see it's a wiggly line and you'll see actually it goes backwards at some points. There were definitely bits of today where I felt I was going backwards. There isn't a postgrad student in the world who has not at some stage felt as if they were going backwards. And generally, when we imagine that we go from A to B, we generally arrive at B star, something that's a bit like B, but not exactly the way we thought. Now, I want you to, th this, is, this is the key slide because understanding the characteristics of complex systems helps us to manage and cope with the unexpected things in the world because the reason things are unexpected are be is because the reasons are because we live in and we are complex systems. When we understand that and kind of take it into ourselves and our beings, oh, that's a, something going past, which is quite unusual. I haven't heard an airplane for a long time. Might be a helicopter from our nearby military base. Right, where was I? Complexity. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story of complexity, and I'm going to link it a little bit to South Africa. Not all of you are South Africans, but you will each have a national story, and it will coincide with your life. But before that, on the left-hand side, I'm going to introduce you to some members of my family. So at the top, you see me with my husband, Tony, at a little dam that's close outside and it's one of the places we're allowed to walk at at the moment. So that's my favorite walking space and I get there usually at about half past seven and I can have an hour and a half's walk in the bush around there. And then below that is my daughter Nikki who has three little boys. On the one side you see Angus who's now four and a half and Nikki's holding the twins Lachlan and Joel who are now one and a half. And then below that is my son, Richard. He's married to Lynn. Nikki's married to Phil. And Richard has two little girls, and you can see me cuddling them there. They are Riley, who's got a mop of dark hair, and Darcy, who's cuddling up in front. And then at the bottom, you can see me with my 90-year-old father swimming in the lagoon at Kenton. And in all of the muddles of putting this together, I, dis I disappeared the photograph of my beloved mum. So she's not... She's there in a virtual sense. So let's have a look at my timeline. I was born in Kenya, in Nairobi. My folks went there to, went, um, went to live there. And I can't, I just need to fiddle because I can't actually see this. There we go, that's, that's easier for me. Um, and, but my parents came back to South Africa really early. I was less than a year by the time we came back, but it was always a very romantic thing for me to know about and understand. It made me feel more part of the African continent than I might otherwise have done. I went to school in the 60s. I matriculated in 74. And you'll see on the right-hand side the word wilderness. Now, going on a wilderness leadership trail process where I walked in the wild, fundamentally changed my life. It was one of those events that had a disproportionately huge impact on who I am and what I do. And that will be true of all of you as well. I decided that instead of doing medicine, I would study biology. I decided I would go to Natal University instead of Wits. I met Tony at Natal University. And meeting Tony meant that when he was drafted into the army and was stationed in King Williamstown, I moved to Rhodes because that was closer. And I ended up here at this university. Unexpected things, adaptations along the way. I then started off on a master's degree and that was also unexpected because honours wasn't an especially happy year for me and I thought I would very happily go back to KwaZulu-Natal. Tony and I both did our degrees at Durban. And we got married at the end of my honours year, 78, and Tony phoned me up about a week before we were to get married and he said, um, um, I've been offered a job 
back in Grahamstown as it was then. Now, I was dreaming of both of us doing our masters at Lake St. Lucia, which I had absolutely lost my heart to in one of those wilderness trails. But I came back. And that was one of a long set of a relationship where one or other of us were put first in what we needed and wanted to do. In that instance, I came back to Grahamstown because Tony wanted to take up his first job. The next huge impact was children having Nikki and Richard. And because of that, I didn't rush straight into a PhD. I ended up by teaching biology. But I was lucky enough to come back and do a PhD. I got funded by Unilever, which meant I could start and run a research center. And then in the 2000s, I was offered a job in Sydney in Australia. Goodness me, out the blue. Well, not quite out the blue. I'd gone to do a small, not a sabbatical, but a visit there. And this time, Tony took unpaid leave from his permanent job and trekked across the world into one of my first permanent jobs because since my PhD, I worked on contract funding. And then Australia, I loved. Loved Sydney, loved swimming in a clear ocean. Um, they have what's called an oligotrophic or low nutrient landscape and their waters are crystal clear. But Tony wasn't happy. He wasn't himself. He didn't find a job that he liked. And so we decided collectively to come home. Now the slide that you see there, I actually put together for my inaugural lecture in 2000 and 10 when I came back to Rhodes and so it ends in the 2010s and I put in um, home then was the last item and so I've popped in grandchildren after that and then in bright red COVID-19. What happened in South Africa over that time? Well I was born into apartheid. I was the product of a very conventional white family. Um, I remember um, Sharpville. I remember my grandparents talking, even though I was very young. I certainly remember Favort and his murder or assassination and Forster. I remember my parents talking about um, their feelings politically. I remember the 76 riots enormously, and I remember standing on my balcony in Grahamstown watching schools burning in the early 80s, wondering about our future here. I remember the delight of Mandela being released and the excitement of democratic elections. I became involved in the amazing opportunity to write a new water law. Um, I went away from South Africa for a while and I came back into a new place where something like the Marikana massacre could happen. That happened shortly before my, my um, inaugural lecture. And we have lived through the years of President Zuma and we have President Ramaphosa. Now you only have to put together those two people's names and um, COVID-19 and you will understand that it would make a tremendous difference who is in charge at this time. And so you have the story of a person's career, the story of a country, and the individual relationships that are most intimate and most important to me. So I want you to ask yourselves some questions and pick up your pencils. I want you to think about what catchment do you live in? And if you don't know, think about your nearest big river. What river that do you know about? Because the catchment will be the landscape around that river. So if you live, for example, in Johannesburg, it would be the Vaal River. If you live in Cape Town, the Berg, nearby Berg River gives you most of your water. If you live in Durban, the Umgeni, and in the Eastern Cape, the many small rivers that run down to the coast. In your catchment, what are some of the things that are difficult? Is it water? Certainly in Makana, it's been water. Is it social unrest? Is it the enormous inequity that we face in South Africa? 
Are there environmental crises? Are there crises in your children's lives? Personal, with education. Are there economic things that are extremely difficult or challenging to deal with? If you understand complexity, you would read in the literature that these kinds of problems are called wicked problems. Not because they're naughty in some way, but because they are so intricate. So many of the interrelationships tie and tighten the system into a knot that is incredibly difficult to deal with. And it's because of those many elements many feedbacks in a history of perhaps power and space and economics that tie you up into things that are extremely difficult to shift. These are intractably difficult problems. And when I realized I was incredibly idealistic about saving the world by understanding biology and by being able to put science and solutions into place, when I worked on the water law, I was understood that you needed to know a whole lot more than that. So when, so if we understand that context is going to drive these wicked problems, and one of the driving wicked problems we're living with now is COVID, when we think of those wicked problems, we, um, we need to think about our context. And there are a few things that will help you think about your context. So if you do have that pencil and paper, could you write down in capital letters, V steep, capital V, capital S, capital T, two E's, E, E, and P, V steep. It helps you unpack context, your own or the place where you work or the place where there's the problem. V is the most important, it's the values. And the reason I put up the photographs of Tony and Nikki and Rich and the kids and cuddling them is because they are the fundamentals of my value system. I do make decisions primarily, primarily around those people. I also am attentive to career and all sorts of economic and other things, but there's no doubt that on a daily basis, it's my intimate family loves and relationships that will drive most of the decisions I make. Then there's social. What are the social things that affect me? It affects me that I live in the Eastern Cape, which is a poor province. I, the, my social context where I see so many people tied up and suffering and caught in poverty, caught in the traps of a post-apartheid system that relegated people into an appalling state, trapped in places that even if I want to help, I find it so difficult to unravel and to find leverage points where I could open things up a little bit. You might have found that too. Then there's the technical. The first T is the technical. Technical can help. It's helping us be on Zoom today. It can also constrain and hold you if you don't have an entry point, if there are things that block you from entering. In, in certainly in South Africa and with my students today, access to internet and access to technology is hampering our ability to work under these constrained circumstances. Then there's the economics. Economics itself is a complex system. And environment, so economics is the one E, environment is the other, I'm an environmental person, and climate change is the other overriding global complex intractable problem. And believe me, just because we've got COVID does not mean that climate change or environmental degradation have gone away. They just happen to be on a back burner for the moment. We see a world that is really enjoying the fact that we're not traveling everywhere. We hope that maybe we've had a chance to revisit our values and to value relationships. And finally, P is political. And we can see in the context of COVID the enormity of a political context. You see the difference between um, our situation where we had an early lockdown, where we've slowed down some of the transmission of COVID. You see the political um, pushback against the laws that have been put in place, particularly in relation to access to food 
and to job security and on a much more trivial level access to cigarettes and liquor although you wouldn't have thought it was so trivial from the response now understanding this complexity might enable you to simply take note and step back and say it is the way it is because it is the nature of the world that it is complex there will be these huge surprises how do i deal what are the tricks of the trade to being in a complex system constructively and in all of my research these are the principles that have emerged as being helpful Tolerate discomfort and unresolved tensions. Goodness, aren't we all tolerating discomfort and fear and anxiety? Tensions in any space are often a gateway to learning and they can build knowledge and trust. Tolerating them actually gives you the space to assess what the different com components on to see if you can in fact find leverage points to unravel things be sensitive to aha moments because all of us have these amazing brains that integrate things and give us insights if we have the time and the space to let that happen engage in the world with balanced generosity listen and speak give and receive balanced generosity is a real gift practice tolerance in any situation of relationality and in any space tolerance is helpful be sensitive to arrivals a new idea a new person a new context covid is a massive arrival what does it mean how does it change the system how do you adapt create and use reflective opportunities take time to just sit and make sense of it and you'll see on the right hand side of this particular slide two people connected but not connected in their place reflecting on their circumstances manage discontinuities this has been one of my biggest lessons because i work very much in bringing people together in workshops and the same people don't arrive and people change in their jobs and the venue gets cancelled and the all of that wiggly line happens all the time and when it happens like when my laptop didn't work this morning i've learned to say okay all right carolyn that's my longer name chill for a minute Practice tolerance, be a bit generous with the people who are trying to help you, even if they're driving you up the wall. Um, take the aha moment of you do have an old laptop, you do have access to the university, you can come in, you do have some slides that you could use, you chill, manage discontinuities. Then sustain inquiry, keep being interested, learn new skills learning is one of the great processes that happen right through our lives and when they happen in complex systems you can soon soon mention that i'm a transdisciplinarian i work in a transdisciplinary way it's because when you deal with complexity it is absolutely impossible for everyone for anyone to know everything you cannot the cleverest person the, the biggest a rated scientist does not know everything and so if you're to engage with complex problems the best possible thing is to gather as much diverse knowledge as you can and to listen and engage respectively and respectfully and generously with many people sustaining inquiry is basically a way of saying don't give up persevere and I want to say to all of you, whatever difficult circumstance this COVID has thrown up, keep going, hang in there. And remember, everyone who is involved in your research and in your life is a whole person. They're not just your mother, your brother. They're not just your lecturer, your supervisor. They are not the manager of the bank. They're a whole person. And they can engage with their whole self and many ways of knowing if you invite them. Invite people to share 
from a wide range of perspectives. Now, I mentioned to you that I look after the Arua Water Centre of Excellence, and here we all are, sitting around a table at the inaugural lecture from nine countries all over Africa, ready to start a complicated, a complex, wonderful, innovative project that would involve all of us. It would involve us in running workshops, in being present, in traveling, in meeting, in being out there with our rivers and our landscapes. And what we have at the moment is a huge question mark. And one of the reasons that I have been able not to panic, I mean, we won um, two million pounds to run this huge project and winning it was completely amazing. But now we have to spend it in ways that we haven't even dreamed of. But because I understand complex systems and I can go and work out which bits fit in with which, what can change, I found it, I found COVID less overwhelming than it might have been, both personally and professionally and in my job. And that's not to say that it hasn't turned my life upside down. That is not to say that I have not absolutely wept at not being there to visit and cuddle these little people and that I don't know when I will. It's not to say that your economic situation or the fact that somebody has died or the fact that somebody has, has contracted COVID or maybe even died in that circumstance. It's not to say that individual things are not overwhelming. What it does say is that if you work back and you understand it a little bit more in terms of this, that understanding can give you a sense of being able to make your way and the fact that you know that it's a wiggly pathway can help you not to despair when it seems to be going backwards. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that, Tally. Um, very inspiring, actually. Um, a really uh, very enjoyable and useful with some very clear frames for all of us. I wonder, I think in a way, I kind of think that I want to sit with your V-S-T-E-E-P and use that to really reflect on my own life and to think about um, the, com um, the complexity. So Pauline has said inspiring indeed and Chimani has say, says I'm clapping virtually. Thank you. Um, I wonder now, we've got a bit of time for a conversation with Tally. I wonder now if any of you have a question or a comment, you've got two ways of sharing it. The one, if you'd prefer, is to tap it into the chat bar. Alternatively, it would be lovely to hear some other voices. So if you just put the letter M for microphone into the chat bar, you can put your hand up using that little hand up feature as well, but most people find it easier to just put M for microphone um, and then I can open your mic and we can hear your voice. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Robin says, thank you for a gracious and human lecture. Amanda, over to you. Yes. Um, thank you so much, um, Tali, for a very insightful way of teaching complexity. I am best here at Stellan Bosch at the Center for Complex Systems oh, in wow. Transition. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, at Ross doing my MSc um, with Charlie Shabuton. Okay. Um, so I am just starting my PhD now, and I am in this place where they talk about complexity, complex systems, complex adaptive systems, systems thinking. And many a time they use all these terms interchangeable. And I wonder if you can um, help me in this uh, place or space where I am in to make sense of all of this. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so the word system means many parts. So, and it implies that those many parts are connected. Yes. Now, what I said in the beginning, the difference between complicated and complex is the way in which the parts are connected. 
In a complicated system, the parts are connected predictably. In a complex system, they are not. If you look at an adaptive complex system, it means that the way in which the processes happen in relation to the context moves the system in a particular direction. So you are, when you move from the sunshine into the shade, because you've been, your body has told you it's hot, you are adapting. You become an adaptive complex system. Our societies are adapting to COVID by lockdown and distancing. That's an adaptation. When we talk about climate change, we adapt to the fact that we are on a trajectory of increasing temperature. That's the adaptiveness. Now, the adaptiveness has two sides to it because the changing context that we live in or demands that we adapt and we can also have foresight and plan to adapt. So adaptive can be demanded and it can be responded to. Some of your other words, can you just, just feed them back to me? So complexity, adaptive, complex adaptive systems. I threw in social ecological systems because we're trying to put the context of a biological system. I am, I know all the folk at your center really well. And if you want to email me after this, we can easily have a chat. Okay. All right. That is, thank you. Thank, thank you very so much. much. I'll follow up on that. Thank you so much, Sue. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Lalu, can I ask you to take the microphone and let's hear from you? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Lalu. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I recently, um, I just also want to start by really thanking you very much, uh, Prof, for, for this insightful and inspiring conversation. Um, I recently uh, co-wrote a play called Dibalo. Dibalo is a Sotho word for numbers. Mm -hmm. And I'm exploring, um, we were exploring the notion of religion Mm -hmm. and how it could be complicated, uh, how it can be complex and complicated, situating it within a person who can have, who can be Dibalo. So if I say, oh, Dibalo, like I say, oh, Dibalo, it means you are complicated or complex. If I say, e Dibalo, this particular thing, then it means that particular thing is complicated or complex. And in this particular instance, looking at religion as a complex and, and, and complicated uh, phenomenon. What I would like to find out if actually, now that you talked about a system, it just got me thinking, and I'm just about to go for, 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 print, for, for, for printing, for publication, but I have two days to change if I messed up things in terms of understanding and using these, comp these terms. Am I right to think that if it is complicated, it's almost like uh, if I were to think of a Sangoma who's, who has had a lot of experience and would have a, a notion of the pattern. Uh, are you burping? Are you, are you feeling hot? Um, like those kind of behaviors. But, but if it is complex, it, it involves many other things that wherever you may be, you may actually not be able at that time to solve it using complex and complicated in that way. Would you say I'm on the right track? Um, now look, you know, for me, everything that you have talked about is complex. So the notion of religion, which takes many parts and parts of of the complex, it is only very predictable systems and usually mechanical systems that I would see as complicated. But that's quite a, it's quite a particular definition. And complicated is used in our general English language 
interlap and 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 um, overlaps with complex. So, in the in the discipline that I work in, which is complexity studies, it would be very difficult. It would be very important to differentiate between complex and complicated. In your context, it may be that there's a looser um, allowance for that. So from my strict point of view, I would say you could only talk about complexity, but I wouldn't say that that needs to be laid on you because your context may allow you more flexibility. Thank you um, for that response. I think that's um, also very useful. And I guess that also shows your, your transdisciplinary background, Tally, that you're so aware that you need to look at where you're using the language and what you're using it for before we get hung up and making sure that it's being used in the way of a particular disciplinary group. Um, because I think, I think that perhaps yeah. in the academy we are at times a little... Um, exclusionary in our um, very or, or elitist in our sort of disregard for anyone who uses terms in ways that that we don't mean. Um, I, I see that uh, Gwendolyn has hasn't put an M, but I'm going to ask Gwendolyn if she wouldn't mind just talking for a little bit, because it sounds like, like Lalu, she's also using this idea of um, the, the complexity um, to make sense. And so Lalu's in, in uh, drama and Gwendolyn is in German studies. So I'm quite enjoying the very rich different disciplinary backgrounds. Gwendolyn, I wonder if you want to just um, make a comment. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, it's been very interesting doing a study that looked at blended learning in context and now having been thrown into this whole situation where learning has gone completely online and then, you know, trying to think about um, how, how these changes in context can really cause massive changes in, in the complex system across the board and in these really unexpected ways. Um, yeah, it's been quite fascinating writing up now the analysis and being able to draw in um, this context that we're in at the moment. Um, it's actually been quite exciting in that way. Um, yeah, I really, it, it's given me a tool also to think about, I think in a lot of um, research and educational research, we, we sometimes only look at one-to-one -one relations. So maybe like the relationship between students and the use of technology, but it's quite difficult and sometimes overwhelming to try and look at the whole picture. You know, it's not just the students with the technology, it's also the lecturers with the technology, the institution with the technology, the students with the <laughs> lecturers, the, um, the social context, the political context, it's everything. Um, yeah, so I've tried to bring that all in. <laughs> we'll see how how effective that has been. But I, I, I liked the way that your presentation showed us that all of life is like that. And, and Lalu study and um, I think someone else mentioned something else. You know, complexity is everywhere. We are complex systems. Language is a complex system. Um, learning is in itself complex. And, and they all interact with each other. And it's like, amazing you know um thank you i felt very inspired thanks gwendolyn oops i've muted tally by mistake i don't know why how i managed to do that tally i'm trying to unmute you now oh there we go gwendolyn what 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 came to mind as you were talking is the fact that there are many tools of the trade in terms of the methods of thinking like this. And I haven't gone there at all, but there are methods and ways of dealing with the reality of complexity. So very happy to chat about that. I want to pick up on Mondo's um, comment. Uh, Mondo's using chat and he's mm -hmm. talking about um, the importance, which of course chat definitely foregrounds, the importance of looking at history. If you, and you, you put that on your own slide. In fact, your, your whole life's chron chronology, you included the South African history and the extent to which um, 
history is, is absolutely crucial to understanding a complex system. And then Robin asks, will we adapt as a species to COVID-19 for better or worse? One of the things I've been fascinated by is watching how different disciplines um, engage with, with the issue around coronavirus. Of course, I'm mostly reading this as translated into the media, and I'm aware that often the translation into the popular press sometimes loses perhaps what the disciplines themselves intended. But it has been very interesting to me how the notion of we following the science, well, it looks very different if you're following the science of mathematical modeling versus you following the science of psychological well-being or, um, or the economists. So I think, you know, I keep hearing this, we're following the science. And I think, well, yeah, wh which, which science? Um, well, it, it will be. Um, will, we, will we adapt? We are adapting. We can't help it. We are a complex system and we adapt. What we can help is how we allow our values to shape and direct the adaptations we choose. Hmm. How much agency do we have to, have our, to allow our own value system to decide how we adapt? It depends on scale. A lot. There'll be scales at which you don't have agency and you simply adapt by watching. But your adaptation then is what I use. I'm thinking about it a lot, mostly because the future looks difficult and I have grandchildren. Um, so my adaptation is to naturally loosen your skin, being less attached, being freer to, be, to do different things when you need to, to being less attached to stuff. Now, that's my value system and way of adapting. And I'm hoping it might be useful at a range of scales. Um, at the moment, you know, where do you walk? How much do you um, accede to lockdown? What is, your, what is your understanding of risk? Who do you, in, are, are you in contact with? Who don't you? But if you're poor and if you don't have food for your children, your ability to adapt is, to this circumstance is much more def, dis, desperate than mine. So the, the marginalized, the anybody, and we, we live in this enormously unequal world, and the marginalized and the people who are on the periphery of things have less capacity to, to, for, to allow their agency to affect their lives. So there's huge inequity. Um, have I, am I with you? Sorry, sorry. I was jabbering away without turning on my microphone. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, Jason has sent me a message um, and he is saying, um, he's talking about complexity in terms of ergonomics, which is certainly something I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought of. But he's just talking about um, the, the profound challenges in the design of systems. If you have uncertainty, uh, fuzzy boundaries, dynamism, multiplicity, the need for perpetual adaptation and so on. On. Um, and so, and healthcare systems, and I think that has been such a good example of the need for complexity. And it's a good example of how historical decisions have current effects. Mm. Mm. Thanks yeah. so much. Any any um, any last questions or comments? Please pop them into the um, chat now before we finish off. And I'm going to ask while you, any of you have got a burning question or an issue you'd like to raise, pop it into the chat or put the letter M. Otherwise, Tally, are there some sort of final words of wisdom? Because I think you've given us some really, really good words of wisdom today. Um, I've, earlier this year, for the first time, I was involved in a MOOC, which I haven't ever done before. And it was on building with nature. So it was a transdisciplinary look at engineering design, which is why I responded so noddingly to the ergonomic design. That's got a bit on transdisciplinary, transdisciplinarity in it, and it's being run again later this year. Um, wisdom. Isn't that, isn't that what we all search for? Isn't it 
how we make sense of our world and how we um, find, I guess what I'm trying to say is be at peace with yourself and with others. I think that the boundary space of complexity allows me to be a scientist and a biologist and somebody who's learned a bit about social science and somebody for whom people and religion is meaningful to make sense of the multiplicity of myself and therefore to accept the different multiplicities of other people. So that's just, if you wanted wisdom, that's my best shot at it. I think that sounds very wise indeed. And it echoes comments given earlier by Colleen and Anthea, who both talked about the need for mindfulness mm. to manage complexity, um, which I guess comes back to your V issue of the, of the values to just to be, to be able to be still and to be clear about yourself and what, and what you value um, in order to make sense of the complexity around us. Thank you so much for your time um, this afternoon. It's been really, really wonderful. And thank you to everybody who's joined us from all over the place. Um, I hope that you found it um, as inspiring as I did. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks, Great. Kelly. Thank you, Sue. Well, if, you, if anyone asks you to do all in case you wanted to say bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.